Should have picked the same chord for both, but the songs I picked out I had to change chords, so here we go. I hadn't learned how to play it forward yet. I sure can't play it back. <laughs> I have found a friend in 
Rupert, thank you so much for doing that. I, I asked Rupert last week if he'd start us out this morning with uh, <clears throat> a couple of songs. I don't know about you, but it just sets the stage for me. It gets me in the in the spirit of worship to hear him him sing and, and play the the guitar so skillfully. Um, and if you missed his Sunday school lesson last week. He talked on mercy last week, and it was a wonderful lesson. Any of you that were here, I'm sure, would agree with that. Um, he did a great job. Okay, let's start out this morning with uh, uh, praises and prayer requests. And if, you, if you'll do me a favor, I don't hear real well, so if you have a prayer request or praise, just pull your mask off long enough so that maybe I can understand what's being said. Um, we want to start out by praying for our country, as we've said for the last few weeks. A lot going on. We need to be in prayer for our country. Obviously, we need to be continue to pray about this uh, coronavirus issue, all the people that's been affected by it, not just physically affected, but uh, as far as illness, but financially uh, affected by it. Continue to lift up Roger Cruz and Robert Harris, Jeff Peden. And um, our, we lost some loved ones in our church this week, and uh, we need to lift those families up. Other prayer requests this morning. Michael Edmonds. Michael Edmonds. Michael Edmonds. Mary Dale passed away this morning about nine. Mary Dale did? Yes. Oh, my goodness. She was a sweetheart. I, I loved her to death. I didn't know that. Mary Dale passed away. I'll tell you one thing, she knew exactly where she was headed when she left this earth, and she died with full confidence. I can tell you that about Mary Dale. Any others? My co-worker's father-in-law is still in ICU at Nash on the 10th with COVID virus. Okay. One day he'll look better, and then one day he'll look worse. It's just an up and down cycle for two weeks, every two weeks. Wow. Lord, 
continue to pray for them. Uh, Mike, I pray that um, <clears throat> my pre treatments for uh, the, the uh, cancer have started that and, uh, and are moving towards the, the, uh, the treatment that I'm going to be taking. And that'll probably be about six weeks away. So. We need to continue to lift Bill up uh, in our prayers for his cancer treatments. Chris's mom's um, husband, his name is Buster. On um, Tuesday, he's going to be having quadruple bypass. Mm -hmm. So be keeping him in your prayers, his mom. And Chris is going to go home tomorrow, so he can be in the area with this them. This is Chris's stepfather? Yes. Okay. He's going to be having quadruple bypass surgery this week. Yeah. Nancy's first cousin. Is it? Bill. 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 Yeah. Any praises this morning? Anybody have uh, something they want to praise the Lord about this morning? Woke up. Woke up. <laughs> and it was a cold morning. Here. 18 degrees when I got up this morning. Yeah. 18, very cold. But that lets us know we're alive, doesn't it? <laughs> I've got one announcement I want to make, or uh, and and before I she's got the phrase. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. I want to introduce some of you to a couple of people. I don't know if you know them or not. This is uh, this couple right back here. This is Scott and uh, Wayne and Mary Ann West, and I got to know them at Lakeside uh, services this summer. They came faithfully to our Lakeside. Sunday school this summer, and a number of us got to meet them there and got to know them, and they've been visiting our church now very regularly. And um, Scott and uh, Scott, I don't know why I keep calling them Scott. Wayne and Mary Ann have, have started a ministry out at um, Norton's on the lake uh, where they have the flea market, and it's called Community Covered. Is that right? You want to tell us a little bit about it? It's basically if you go by and, and, and you need some, someone goes by and they need something, they get it out. And if you've got something you want to contribute, you just go by and put it in. So very simple concept, but it could help it could help people. So thank you so much for that. Anything else before we have our prayer? Bill Overby, do you mind opening us up with a word of prayer this morning? <clears throat> Let's pray. <clears throat> Pardon me. Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you, and we just thank you for the opportunity to be here to worship uh, to worship you and to uh, with brothers and sisters in Christ. 
And Father, we, uh, we, we bring those that uh, have been mentioned to you, uh, that you will comfort those that are, that are grieving for loved ones, that are, that are lost, that are dealing with sicknesses. We ask that, Father, that you would surround them with your love, that they would know of your presence, of your healing. And, uh, and Father, we would ask for healing for these, for these that, are, that are suffering and that in, in the past that are having uh, health, health issues. Now, Father, we just ask that you would be with us through this morning, be with us through this Sunday school time, be with Mike as he brings the message that you've given him, that you've prepared his heart for. We ask that you would open our, open our hearts, open our eyes, open our minds, and Father, open our lives to your word that we would seek to live for you and all that we are and all that we say, all that we do, and that everything that we are will glorify you. Father, again, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> I'd like to start off this morning before actually getting into our lesson in Luke, talking a little bit about the author, about Luke himself. Um, Luke was the only author in the Bible who was not a Jew. Did you know that? The only author in the Bible that was not a Jew. He was a Greek, a Gentile, a non-Jew. And as a Gentile, Luke's gospel is a little different. It reflects the fact that, that it was written by a Gentile. Um, for example, Luke traced the lineage of Jesus all the way back to Adam. Whereas in the book of Matthew, Matthew only traced Jesus' lineage back to Abraham. He traced it back as far as the Jewish lineage went, and that was where he stopped. And, and Matthew did that because it, it proved that uh, Jesus had a legitimate right to the throne of David. Um, but Jesus' lineage being traced back to Adam is significant in Luke's gospel. And that's found in uh, chapter 3, verses 23 through 28. Luke's gospel makes it clear that although salvation came through the Jews, it was for anyone who accepted Jesus. Jew and Gentile alike made no difference. Luke also wrote the book of Acts. So he authored two books in the New Testament. The Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. Luke was not an original disciple of Jesus. Um, he was not an eyewitness to the life and the works of Jesus. He wrote his Gospel account about 65 years actually after Jesus' crucifixion. Paul, he was not an eyewitness. He didn't live with Jesus. And he wrote Romans approximately 60 years or more after Jesus was crucified. Paul and Luke traveled together at times and ministered and, and worshiped together. We know that from Acts chapter 16 where Luke says he was with Paul when Paul had the Macedonian um, vision. Luke was a physician. In Colossians 4.14, Paul refers to him as the beloved physician. So he was obviously an educated man. When Luke was saved, he likely walked away from a successful career as a physician to share Jesus with the world. Luke only recorded events and statements of Jesus and others that he could verify as factual. He wanted to be absolutely positive that everything he put in his gospel was true. He researched and verified everything he wrote. And he states that himself. If you look at Luke chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, he says, It seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order. Most excellent Theophilus. So you might know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. He made sure in his writing that the outcasts in the world would know they were welcome in God's kingdom. He included three parables about lost things being found to show that Jesus was serious about saving the lost. Uh, in Luke chapter 15, we have the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son that we refer to as the prodigal son 
parable. Did you know that Luke is the only gospel writer that recorded the prodigal son parable? And that's one of the most beloved, beloved parables in the entire Bible. Uh, there's, there's probably been literally millions of sermons preached on that prodigal son parable. All four of the gospel accounts are different. You know, some include events that the others omit. The details sometimes differ between one account and another. And critics who are always looking for a reason to attack the Bible will attack it on the basis of the differences and the inconsistencies between the different gospel accounts. But actually, those differences make the Bible more reliable, not less reliable. Uh, people see events and respond to them in different ways. Even the very same event can be witnessed by numerous people, and they'll, they see it in different ways. Let me give you an example of that. If three of us were standing in the parking lot out here after church talking, and a car came speeding into the parking lot, spun around three or four times doing donuts, and then sped back out of the parking lot, and someone called the police, and the police came out, and they interviewed the three of us that saw it. One would say, okay, yeah, it was a great car, came in here at a high rate of speed, spun around three times, there was a woman driving, and there was two other people in the car. You ask the next person, well, what did you see? Well, the car wasn't great, it was silver. And uh, I didn't see but one person, and that was the person driving. It was a lady with long hair, and she didn't look like, she looked crazy. <laughs> and then the third person says, well, it was a, a 2016 silver Subaru, and uh, it had raised white leather tires. I couldn't tell you a thing about the people that were driving. <laughs> we all saw the same event, right? but we all were focused on something different. So we all, none of us are lying. We're just giving our version of what we saw. And that's what we have in the Bible with the gospel accounts. So it actually makes the, the Bible more reliable. Now today's lesson is entitled Receive Redemption. And it comes from Luke chapter four, verses 16 through 30. In the lesson this morning, we're going to study how Jesus offered redemption to all people, but he was often rejected. Jesus never let rejection stop him or cripple him in any way from fulfilling his mission on earth. Have you ever been rejected? You men, think back when you were in high school or college. There was some pretty young lady that you wanted to ask out for a date. It might have taken you a week to get your nerve up. And finally you go up to her and you ask her out. And that pretty little lady, pretty little gal looks at you and smiles and she says, are you crazy? <laughs> Why would I go out with you? You're the ugliest guy in this whole school. I'm not going out with you. Now that's rejection. And that hurts. And it takes a little while to get over that. Um, I have a friend who asked, met a young lady in college. He asked her, according to him, dozens of times out for a date. She wouldn't go out with him. And finally, he just wore her down, and she went out with him, and they started dating. And after they dated for a year or more, he started asking her to marry him. And it was the same thing. He asked her over and over and over until he finally wore her down, and she agreed to marry him. And it worked. They've been married 30-some years, great couple. Uh, so persistence pays off. We have to be persistent. We can't let rejection stop us and cripple us and knock us down. In the verses this morning, um, Luke tells us about one instance where Jesus was strongly rejected, strongly rejected. But before we get into our verses for today, I want us to take a look at the setting uh, of this lesson. Jesus had just returned to Galilee, which was his home region, and actually back to his hometown of Nazareth after being tempted by Satan in the wilderness for 40 days. 
If you remember the story, Satan had tempted him by, uh, in three ways. He tried to get him to turn bread or stones into bread because Jesus was obviously hungry in the wilderness. He tempted him by trying to get Jesus to worship him instead of God the Father. And he also tempted Jesus to test God the Father's ability to save him from death. Here's a question for you. What weapon did Jesus use against Satan each time Satan tempted him? The Bible. The Bible, God's Word. He used God's Word. The first temptation where, where Satan tempted him to turn stones into bread, Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 8.3. He said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. The second temptation where Satan tempted him to worship him instead of God, Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 6.13. He said, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only. And finally, the third temptation when, Je when Satan took him to the pinnacle of the temple and told him to jump off because God would protect him. Deuteronomy 6.16, Jesus said, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Satan tempted Jesus three times in the wilderness and three times Jesus punched him in the mouth. And every time he punched him in his, in his mouth, he used God's word to do it. Can we do the same thing? Sure we can. Sure we can. But we have to know the scriptures well enough to know when and how to throw that scriptural punch to knock Satan off his feet. Now, here's a question for you. What weapon did Satan use against Jesus on the third temptation? The Bible. the Bible. Satan used God's word. You know, we lose sight of the fact that um, Satan knows every word in this Bible. He can quote scripture as good as anyone. If you put together a team of Ten of the best Bible scholars on the planet and let them play Bible trivia or some kind of biblical knowledge game against Satan, Satan would wear them out. He'd wear them out. He knows God's word. He knows every word of it is true. He knows every word of it is inspired by God himself. And he knows the incredible power of God's word that's why he hates it so much. That's why he hates it so much. I believe every time we open the Bible and study God's word, Satan cringes because he knows it makes it tougher for him to get to us the more time we spend in God's word. Okay, after being tempted, Jesus goes to his home region of Galilee where he was brought up. He goes actually to his hometown of Nazareth. And on the Sabbath, he goes to worship in the temple. And this is where our lesson begins this morning, Jesus going to the, to the synagogue to worship. So if you have your Bibles this morning, you can follow along in Luke chapter 4, starting with verse 16. Or if you've got your quarterlies, you can, you can use that. Um, let me start out by reading for you Luke 4, verses 16 through 21. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the free oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. Now, let's break these verses down a little bit. 
Jesus returned to his hometown of Nazareth. He said, the scripture says that as usual, or your Bible may say, or as was his custom, <coughs> he went to the synagogue to worship. It was Jesus' normal weekly routine to attend church. Jesus knew he was supposed to be in the Lord's house on the Lord's day to worship every week. And he faithfully attended worship services. And you know, for the last 10 months or so, we've been going through some very, very unusual, difficult times, haven't we? Um, churches all across America from coast to coast have closed their doors, gone to virtual services because of the pandemic. Being able to put our Sunday school lessons, worship services, and everything that we do out on social media during this pandemic has been a tremendous blessing for our church and all churches all across the country. And I'm so thankful for our technically talented people like Brad and our media team and, and the people that have been able to make this happen. But I have to tell you, I have some fears and some reservations about it. Um, my fear is that people all across the country, not just our church, are getting far too accustomed to a social media style of worship. People enjoy sitting on the couch in their pajamas on Sunday morning and drinking a cup of coffee and eating a donut and having their laptop in their, in their lap watching the service. I think churches run the risk of people getting out of, as Jesus said, the usual habit or the custom of actually physically attending church. I also believe we run the risk of people beginning to demand a social media option to physically attending church in the future. And all I want to say about this is God never intended us to forsake worshiping together. It was never his plan. Um, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Christians staying home on Sunday is not a new thing. It was happening during Jesus' time. Uh, the author of this verse in Hebrews says, forsaking the assembling together as is the habit of some. So people were in the habit then of not attending worship services. Nothing new. You, and I'm not saying you can't be a Christian and worship at home. You certainly can. You certainly can. I'm just saying it was never what God intended. So, so what are some of the things that we accomplish or how do we benefit from meeting physically together as a church? Well, think about what Paul said about the church. The church is a body and it functions very similar to our physical bodies. Our physical bodies, we have eyes that see. We have ears that hear, and in my case, not real well. Uh, we have hands and arms that we can do work with. We have feet and legs for mobility to move around. Well, the church functions in a very similar way the way God put it together. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, I think it's 12, 18, that God placed the members in the body as it pleased him in order to make the body work the way it's supposed to. Um, not all of us in the church are teachers. Not all of us are good at, have good administration skills. So God placed a variety of people within his body, the church, to perform different things so that it works like our human bodies do. Um, some teach, some are good at leading, uh, leading the teenagers, some sing, some play instruments. In Rupert's case, they do both. Um, 
Some people are, are just tremendous prayer warriors in the church. Some work with children, some better with teenagers, some work in the nursery. You know, your job in this church may be to sit in a rocking chair on Sunday mornings back in that nursery and hold and love on some little fussy baby. And I would say to you this morning that your job, if that's your job, is as vital and crucial to the health and the success of this church as any position in this church. That's how God put the church together. And we miss that when we don't meet together. We also grow to maturity as Christians in the body of believers in the church. Uh, Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 8 and Ephesians 4. We also exercise our spiritual gifts in the church. First Corinthians 12, Paul talks about um, spiritual gifts and he explains how we're all given different gifts but that all the gifts that Christians are given are given not for personal, excuse me, not for personal gain or personal reasons. They're given to us to edify the church. In other words, to make the church function correctly and grow stronger. That's why we're given spiritual gifts. We learn how to, to handle tough times in the church. In the body of believers. We share our grief with one another. We talk to people who've been through similar situations that we've been, and we draw, draw encouragement and strength from that in the body. And, of course, obviously the fellowship that we enjoy in the body that uh, we can't, you just can't replace it when you're not meeting together. So, look, I've just said all these things just as a reminder to us of just how important it is for Christians to meet as a body of believers and not to forsake that. Jesus is our example for every aspect of our life, and Jesus Christ went to church on, on Sabbath. Okay, enough on that. Let's look at uh, Luke chapter 4. I'm going to talk a little bit now about verses 17 through 20. Now, Jesus has gone to the synagogue to worship. Now, the synagogue services in Jesus' day uh, consisted of various people reading the Old Testament scrolls or scriptures. Now, on this particular morning, Jesus was given the scroll of Isaiah to read. And Jesus read Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 2, and he also pulled a verse from uh, Isaiah 58, verse 6. <clears throat> now these verses describe the mission of the Messiah, the coming Messiah that the Jews were looking for. Preach good news to the poor, both the physically and spiritually poor. Proclaim freedom to the captives of sin, to restore sight to the blind, and to set free the oppressed. Now, the Jewish leaders at that time also saw these verses as references to the year of Jubilee. Jews in the temple that morning probably expected Jesus to explain these verses based on the year of Jubilee because that was how most Jews interpreted these verses. Now, what's the year of Jubilee? Well, every 50th year, the Jews celebrated what they referred to as the year of Jubilee. During the year of Jubilee, people's debts were forgiven and written off. Slaves were set free. Property was returned to its original owners. And the year was dedicated to rest. The people would rest and they would grow no crops. So they allowed the land to rest during the year of Jubilee. Now, if Jesus had just referred to the year of Jubilee with these scriptures, everything would have been fine. But he would have said exactly what they expected him to say, but Jesus didn't do that. He told them something else. In Luke chapter 4, verse 21, he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled 
in your hearing. Jesus confirmed that these, these scriptures that he had just read referred to him. They were talking about him. He was telling them, I am the Messiah, the one you've been waiting for all these years. You don't have to wait any longer. I'm here. I am the Messiah. Now, let me read verses 22 through 27. that went way down. They were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Yet they said, Isn't this Joseph's son? Then he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Doctor, heal yourself. What we've heard that took place in Capernaum, do here in your hometown also. He also said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But I say to you, there were certainly many widows in Israel in Elijah's days, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, while a great famine came over all the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them except a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. And in the prophet Elisha's time, there were many in Israel who had leprosy. Yet none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Verse 22 indicates that the, the crowd was shocked and confused at this point. They were saying, isn't this Joseph's son? They had literally watched this young man grow up in their midst. And now he was proclaiming to them that he was the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah, Savior of the Jews. And then in verse 23, Jesus said to them, No doubt you'll quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. What we've heard that took place in Capernaum, do here in your hometown also. See, Jesus knew they would want miraculous proof that he was the Messiah. They'd heard about his healings. They'd heard about him casting out demons. They'd heard about him raising Jairus' daughter from the dead. They wanted to see him do the same type of things in Nazareth, but Jesus had other ideas, and he wasn't finished making his point to them either. Verse 24, Jesus spoke to them again. He said, truly I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Is that, is that still true today? Is it hard to view somebody as uh, famous or spectacular or supernatural if it's somebody you grew up with that was in your hometown? Because you remember them as just an ordinary person, one of the, one of the guys, one of the gals, um, no great accomplishments, nothing extra, somebody who occasionally did something goofy or embarrassing. Um, so, you know, it's hard to see them as this spectacular personality when you grew up with that person. And that's what Jesus knew was taking place with him right there in Nazareth. Now, verses 25 through 27 <laughs> Jesus points out something to these Jewish religious leaders that they didn't want to hear. Let me read 25 through 27. Um, but I say to you, there were certainly many widows in Israel in Elijah's days when the sky was shut up for three years and six months while a great famine came over all the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them except a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. And in the prophet Elisha's time, there were many in Israel who had leprosy, yet none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Jesus gives two examples from the scriptures where God came to the aid of someone who was in distress a starving widow in Sidon, 
and a man with leprosy in Syria. Why would that upset these Jewish religious leaders so much? They were Gentiles. John, I'll give you some candy. You're with it this morning. Thank you. Exactly. They were Gentiles. And you have to understand, a Gentile to these Jews was not much more than a dog. That's, that's just the facts. That's the way they felt about anyone who was not a Jew. Um, yeah, these people were not Jews. Uh, he was t What Jesus was telling them was that God loved the Gentiles also. And during a time when the Jews had leprosy and the Jews were starving to death, God chose to rescue a couple of Gentiles. And Jesus' point here was he was telling them that he was there to bring redemption for all people, not just the Jews. Well, Jesus might as well have spat in their face at that point. They immediately became enraged. Have you ever stirred up a nest of ground bees Yellow jackets or brown bumblebees? Some of you have, yeah. Well, those little rascals will eat you alive. Not just one or two of them. If you linger too long, they'll all be on you. Um, and yellow jackets will bite you and sting you at the same time. Many years ago, I had a, <clears throat> a tract of timber down in Bertie County that I had to do some work on. And... When I got there that morning, I turned in the driveway, which went back to the timber, but it also went, it was the driveway to the farmer's house. And as soon as I turned into the driveway, there was a lady uh, working in her flower bed up in front of me, in, in front of the house, and she had a little low stool, and she was sitting on that stool in her flower bed, I assume pulling weeds or thinning some plants out or whatever. Well, I no sooner turned in the driveway that she jumped to her feet and she was looking right in my direction, but I don't think she even saw me. I, don't, I think she was just looking that way. She jumped to her feet and she had on one of these uh, cotton skirts that come down almost to your ankles. And she reached down and grabbed the hem of that cotton skirt and threw it up <laughs> over her head. And then back down and up again and down and up again. She did that three or four times. And I slammed on brakes to keep her running in the ditch in the driveway. I didn't know what was going on. And after she did that about four times, she whirled around and ran up the front steps and in the door of the house and slammed the door behind her. Well, I'm, I'm just sitting out there in my truck with my mouth hung open. Um, you know, wonder what in the world this woman's crazy. She may come running back out of the house any minute with a shotgun and shoot me. But I, after a couple minutes, I decided, well, I still got to do some work. So I drove on up the path and I had to drive right by that stool as close as for me to stand. And when I got up adjacent to that stool in that flower bed, that was a yellow fog about this high off of the ground, that stool, that stool was yellow with bees. They were crawling all over the ground. That poor lady had squatted down with that stool right over that entrance to that yellow jacket nest. They had come out under her skirt and were wearing her out. I'm going to give you some advice based on a long career of working in the woods and having been stung probably several hundred times by yellow jackets. When you realize you've got one or two of them on you that are trying to sting you, don't stand there and swat at them and fight them. You run right then. You put about 70 yards between you and them. Because if you linger, even a few seconds, those two will turn into 200 and they'll eat you up. Don't fight yellow jackets, run from them. Well, that morning, Jesus, he hadn't stirred up a nest of bees, he stirred up a nest of religious leaders. 
He pointed out some verses of scripture to them they didn't want to hear and that they didn't like. Do people react negatively today to scriptures they don't like? Yep, we sure do. Not much has changed since biblical times, has it? You know, I tell people all the time, <coughs> the Bible is just as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. And the reason the Bible is still just as relevant today is because people have not changed. We wear different clothes. We get around different, differently. We travel different by different means. But people are just the same today as they were in Jesus' time. Yeah, we don't like scriptures that call our behavior into question. We don't like scriptures that make us feel guilty. We don't like verses that convict us or verses that talk about suffering or pain or judgment. You know, some of these big mega churches across the country preach and teach what I call feel-good messages. Um, that's why they have 50,000 members, some of them. They avoid scriptures that convict us of our sins and shortcomings. They never preach on verses that, as I say, will step on your toes or bloody your nose. They focus entirely on love and joy and peace and happiness and contentment and prosperity and on and on and on. And that would be all right if they preached the whole Bible in addition to that. But they totally ignore the scriptures about obedience, avoiding sin, the consequences of sinful behavior, suffering as a servant of the Lord. We have to teach and preach and accept all of God's word, all of it. We can't pick it apart like picking onions out of a salad. I don't like onions in a tossed salad. Um, and whenever I order one out, I always try to remember to tell the waitress, please, no onions in my salad. But if I forget and they bring me a salad that's got raw onions in it, first thing I'll do is I'll pick every one of them out if I can find them because <laughs> I like onions, but they don't like me particularly well. So I, I try not to eat them raw. But we can't do God's word that way. Every single word in that Bible is significant. It's there for a reason. So how did the Jewish leaders react to these unpopular verses that Jesus explained to them? Let's close by looking at our final two verses, verses 28 and 30 in chapter 4. <clears throat> when they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. They got up, drove him out of town, and brought him to the edge of the hill that, had, that the town had been built upon, intending to hurl him over the cliff. But he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. Verse 28 says, All in the synagogue, or everyone in the synagogue, was enraged. So he didn't enrage just a few of them. They were all in agreement. That man had to die for what he had said. They weren't irritated, they weren't frustrated, they weren't mildly angry. They were enraged, enraged enough to drag Jesus out and try to kill him. Verse 29 says they drove him out of the temple and led him to a cliff to throw him off. Now Nazareth was built on a hill and on one side there was a steep cliff and they carried him to the edge of that cliff with the intentions of throwing him off the cliff and killing him. But something unexplainable happened <coughs> at the edge of that cliff. Verse 30 says, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. He passed right through the crowd and went on his way. The scripture doesn't tell us that Jesus broke into Kung Fu fighting and whipped all of them and then walked away. Uh, it doesn't tell us that he ripped loose from the, the men that were holding him and ran off to get away from them. Scripture just says he walked right back through the crowd of people that wanted to kill him and left. Now this implies a miracle. 
Imagine the men who had a hold of Jesus, probably a couple of men on each side of him, had him by his arms, just as tight as they could hold him because they were dragging him through town to get him to the edge of the cliff. And now they had him at the edge of the cliff, so they were ready to toss him over. And all of a sudden they said, well, where'd he go? I had him by the arm. And they turn around and, his, and look, and Jesus is walking right back through this crowd that we've already said was 100% in agreement that he should be killed. They were enraged. And instead of going around them or going in another direction, the scripture says Jesus just simply walked right back through a crowd of people that wanted to kill him and left. It was a miracle. But it's a miracle that doesn't get much attention in the Bible when you compare it to the other miracles that Jesus performed. But it was a miracle nevertheless. Now this event happened at the very beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. He experienced terrible rejection in his hometown of Nazareth. But Jesus stayed the course. He didn't let this rejection cripple him in his, in his ministry or, or stop him in any way. He never gave up. He continued to share his message of love and redemption with anyone and everyone who was willing to listen to him. Jesus is our example today on how to handle rejection, especially rejection when we share the gospel. Um, some of you are familiar with Bill Bright. Bill Bright was the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ many years ago. And Bill Bright uh, gave a definition for success in witnessing. And what Bill Bright said was success in witnessing is simply taking the initiative to share Jesus with others in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results up to God. We're not responsible for the people we witness to. If we leave here this afternoon and we witness to a hundred people about the love of Jesus and every one of them laughs at us, none of them except Jesus, we have done our job faithfully. We have done exactly what God wants us to do. We are not responsible. He does not put that burden on our shoulders. All he asks us to do is share. Go out and share in love. We cannot let the rejections that we receive kill or cripple our ability and our desire to witness. And that's what our lesson this morning was all about, is we can't let rejection stop us. Jesus didn't allow it to stop him. He didn't allow it to even slow him down. And we have to be the same way. Now, some applications for what we've heard this morning very quickly. Um, we need to always remember the importance of physically worshiping together in the body. We need to use the power of God's word to defeat Satan when he tempts us. Um, remember, God never tempts us. Whenever we come under temptation, that's Satan. And that's told to us in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 13, that God never tempts anyone. That's always Satan. Also remember that Jesus brought redemption for every person. No one was excluded. We should never allow rejection to stop us from being faithful witnesses for Christ. And one final application, never stand over a yellow jacket nest and swat bees. <laughs> Run. Okay, any questions or comments? Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you this morning for the opportunity to stand up here. Lord, you know I'm not, I'm not much of a teacher. I'm not qualified. But Lord, through you, I'm able to do things that, that I wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And I just praise you and thank you for the opportunity. And Lord, I thank you for your precious word. Um, so powerful, so relevant even today. Um, Lord, it can strengthen us. It can get us through things that we could never get through without it. Uh, it teaches us, it leads us, it guides us, it directs us, it convicts us. It does everything in our life that we need if we're faithful to it. Father, I pray now for our church. I pray for uh, 
uh, Chris as he brings the message this morning. I pray that the, the message he brings will be your message. And Lord, I pray if there's one person here this morning that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that they'd come to that saving knowledge this morning. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.